Thank you very much for the um, kind applause. Um, so, um, and also, of course, thank you very much for the invitation to give a, a talk here. I moved to uh, Zurich just two months ago, so I'm very fresh in Switzerland, uh, but I like it already very much. Um, so I hope to come back here many times. So uh, the title of the talk is, uh, you know, just lists three big subject areas, but of course, I'm going to talk about some rather specific problems. Um, and I also apologize to those that have been at the ICMP because I gave basically this talk there already. But uh, as one of my mentors said, um, repetition is the mother of memory, so uh, perhaps it will help you uh, remember better. Okay, so um, the context of my talk um, is the Einstein vacuum equation, and I will be interested in uh, stability problems in general relativity. And so to uh, set this up a little bit, let me first move this further out of the way. Um, what is a space-time, um, which uh, will be the um, unknown uh, for the Einstein vacuum equation, it's a four-dimensional manifold, and I'll give you some examples uh, relevant to the talk um, later. And on that manifold, uh, you have a Lorentzian metric, uh, and I'll take the signature convention minus plus plus plus. Um, and there is some uh, global causality condition that's called global hyperbolicity. If you don't know what it is, um, you shouldn't worry about it too much. Um, the equation that distinguishes out of these space times those that are physically relevant in vacuum is the Einstein vacuum equation written here. Uh, so it just states that the Ricci curvature of the metric G is equal to zero. And uh, so Ricci curvature is something extremely explicit. So there's uh, the beginning of the explicit uh, formula for it. So the Ricci tensor is a symmetric two tensor, which is a four by four matrix. Um, and the IJ component is given by some nonlinear expression involving up to second derivatives of the metric. It turns out that this equation has uh, some sort of character of a wave equation. And I'll explain that in more detail. Um, typically, this equation is formulated uh, in a slightly different form using the Einstein tensor. And there might be a non-trivial right-hand side encoding matter and energy content. Uh, which is very important, as we heard yesterday in uh, Ruth Durer's talk, uh, especially in cosmology. Um, but uh, even the vacuum equation is extremely rich already in um, geometry and dynamics and describes already things such as black holes, which will be the main player of the talk. Um, there is a generalization of this equation, also proposed by Einstein himself, that involves an extra uh, parameter of the theory, um, lambda, the cosmological constant. And uh, so you demand that the, um, uh, the metric not be Ricci flat, but actually um, the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric with this proportionality factor. And according to the Nobel Prize Committee, uh, lambda is positive. And so that's uh, what the main theorem will actually um, also be about. Um, OK. So now, uh, yes? Uh, it's symmetric in the differential geometry sense. So um, it's uh, at each point, right? So uh, you have uh, G. Um, it has four. Uh, it's a four by four matrix. So you have IJ components. Um, of this matrix at each point um, on your four-dimensional manifold. So it's a, it's a tensor, symmetric two tensor on the manifold. Perfect. Yeah, questions whenever you have any. Okay, so what are some examples? The um, simplest example is the Minkowski space-time, uh, which was already written down before the um, final equations of relativity. And so the, uh, the manifold is just uh, R4 with coordinates T, X, Y, Z. And the metric is uh, as written down. It's sort of the uh, Lorentzian uh, signature version of the Euclidean metric. So you have uh, this time direction that comes with the minus sign. Okay. Uh, the next interesting one is the Schwarzschild metric, which is, was just covered uh, in 1916. And so in this case, the manifold um, I wrote down here as a product of sort of a time direction, T star, um, it's not the usual T coordinate in any case. And then uh, the spatial coordinates, um, I introduced polar coordinates. So R is basically the distance from the center of the black hole. Um, and then uh, you have sort of a, a space of directions, the two sphere floating around as well. And so uh, here's the explicit form of the metric. It's just to impress upon you the fact that it's a very simple solution. So it could be found without uh, computer algebra. Um, and uh, the remarkable fact is that this metric actually already describes a black, uh, a black hole. So I want to briefly explain how that works. So there's this parameter um, in, in this metric here. Uh, which is the mass m of the black hole can be any real number physically speaking it's going to be positive positive. and uh, if you're faced with such a, such a lorentzian metric there is one particular geometric object you can uh, draw at each point of your uh, space time which is the light cone namely you take all the tangent vectors at that point on your manifold whose squared length with respect to this right indefinite quadratic form here are equal to zero and so that gives you a, a double cone 
And so I'm drawing a bunch of uh, these light cones uh, here for the Schwarzschild metric. And uh, so you, you might either do the calculation yourself or believe this picture. Um, so what happens is that these light cones, as you get closer and closer to the black hole, tilt more and more towards r equals zero. And uh, physically speaking, what, uh, what is happening is that a massive observer traveling in the space time um, always has to move along tangent directions that are uh, contained in the interior of this future like upwards pointing cone. Okay, so if you find yourself uh, um, on this side here, at this point, you can move in the forward direction, you know, in, it's a little hard to do by hand here, in this direction here, or you can move in this direction, or you could decide to travel towards the black hole, that's perfectly acceptable. However, once you have crossed this uh, hypersurface R equals 2m, you're forced to travel even further towards R equals zero. And so you actually hit a singularity in finite time. So that's the geometric picture of what a black hole is. Once you're um, too close to it, once you're on the other side of the so-called uh, uh, event horizon here, you have no way of escaping back to the outside region anymore. Okay, so it's a very simple geometric uh, phenomenon that's happening here. Um, okay, and uh, I, I always find it amazing that some of the second simplest solution of these field equations describes black holes. It's uh, kind of a miracle. Okay, so um, this Schwarzschild family of metrics was further generalized in the 1960s by Roy Kerr. Um, and uh, it's a generalization of this uh, family of metrics that also involves angular momentum. So it describes a black hole that is not just a spherically symmetric, but actually is sort of spinning. So you can think of it as the end product of the uh, collapse of a spinning star. Um, and again, there's an explicit formula, but it's much, uh, much uglier, so I'm not going to write it down. Okay, so all these space times so far have been um, explicit. I can just write down the solution of the Einstein vacuum equation for you. But of course, the actual universe is going to be much more um, interesting and uh, dynamical. So for instance, all these metrics here didn't depend on time, actually, right? There's no T dependence. And uh, to get uh, time dependence and dynamics into the picture, uh, the usual way to do it um, is uh, to study the initial value problem. So I mentioned that the Einstein vacuum equation is sort of a wave equation. And so any good wave equation should have an initial value problem where you specify the initial amplitude of the gravitational field and the initial rate of change. And then the Einstein equation tells you how that uh, evolves um, towards the future in the past. And uh, more precisely, this uh, um, initial value problem is formulated as follows. So you give yourself the sort of instant in time in your universe, which is a three-dimensional uh, manifold sigma. And uh, you're given two pieces of data, which are Riemannian metric gamma and a symmetric two tensor uh, that are called K. They have to satisfy certain compatibility conditions called the constraint equations. Um, and the goal of this initial value problem is to find a space time with this sort of extra causal uh, condition here, uh, m comma g, which of course you want to satisfy the Einstein uh, vacuum equation. And moreover, this initial uh, surface here, uh, sigma and the data gamma and k are contained in this uh, as a hypersurface in your ambient space time in such a way that uh, this Riemannian metric g, uh, gamma is the restriction of your space time metric g to this hypersurface. And uh, this uh, symmetric two tensor k gives you the extrinsic curvature of the hypersurface within the avian space time, so the, the second fundamental form. Um, so uh, gamma and k sort of play the role of amplitude and rate of change of amplitude of the gravitational field. Um, and there are very classical theorems. Uh, Yvonne schuke was a postdoc of Einstein's, I believe, at the time she proved that. I don't think he cared about this theorem that much, but uh, it's foundational, uh, obviously. Um, and then uh, Gero um, with schuke proved the sort of uh, global version. The statement is that uh, this initial value problem is well posed, so there always exists, at least locally in some sense, um, a solution um, of this uh, initial value problem. Um, so existence is one part of the story, but of course uh, uniqueness is uh, always a different question, and it turns out that solutions of this um, equation are thoroughly non-unique. And uh, so, there, so I suppose the physicists call it the general covariance of the theory. Um, and mathematically speaking, uh, what uh, is the case is that if you, if you have your space-time manifold and you take any diffeomorphism phi that you know, maps your manifold to sort of some distorted version of itself, and you pull back the metric G under this diffeomorphism, you get again a solution of the Einstein vacuum equation. And if this diffeomorphism, some of you're distorting your manifold or your coordinate systems, um, uh, only non-trivially away from your initial surface, sigma, then in fact, the initial conditions are also perfectly uh, um, respected. So uh, in other words, the solution of this initial problem cannot possibly be unique, but it turns out it is unique up to exactly this uh, uh, pullback along the theomorphisms. So sort of up to coordinate changes, if you will. 
Okay, so that's the initial value problem. Now, how does that look like uh, in action to get dynamical space times? And so there's, a, um, again, another foundational theorem in the field proved by Chris Dudulu and Kleinerman in 93. So Chris Dudulu at the time was not yet at ETH, but uh, um, he did move to ETH a few years uh, after that. So it's a sort of a Swiss minus 10 years theorem. Um, and so the setting here is that uh, sigma, this initial surface is uh, R3 and uh, the cosmological constant is zero. And um, the initial data now are taken to be close to the trivial data. So remember the Minkowski metric um, was you know, uh, this up here. If you restrict this to t equals zero, you just get the Euclidean metric. And also t equals zero is um, um, uh, um, totally geodesic. So the second fundamental form is zero. So you have uh, data gamma and k that are close to the Euclidean metric and the trivial second fundamental form in some particular function space, of course. Then uh, the theorem states that uh, the maximal solution, the maximal space time evolving from these initial data um, lives on R4, it's given by some metric G, um, and it's geodesically complete. So that means in uh, simpler terms, no singularities form. So if you sort of start with a weak gravitational field initially, um, it will just disperse. And uh, more dramatically, in some sense, uh, it will not just disperse to something, but it will actually uh, converge back to the Minkowski metric as time or space go up to infinity. Okay, so that's the stability of Minkowski space. The metric just, uh, um, all degrees of freedom just radiate away. And uh, you're ultimately left just with the metric that you set out to perturb. Um, and so there's a precursor to this for special initial data and that this theorem has generate, uh, generated a lot of activity. So there are just some uh, theorems related to just this Minkowski stability problem, but there's lots of uh, related work for matter models and so on. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about now is the, um, the stability problem for black holes. And uh, the first part of the talk, which is going to be the main part, uh, will concern the black hole stability problem for uh, positive cosmological constants uh, corresponding to black holes that live inside of accelerated, I mean, inside of universes undergoing accelerated expansion. Um, and uh, I will explain why that makes the problem more tractable mathematically. Uh, yes, please. This notion of close to Minkowski, mm -hmm. how do you define it? Because you can have just very little energy, but if it's very concentrated, you can still form black holes. Yeah, so that's right. So that's the right. So in a weighted civil life space, so um, that so uh, first of all, the topology has to be R three, so you cannot sort of make a little hole in and sort of have localized strong uh, curvature or something like that. And so basically, um, so I think I'm not sure what the optimal bound is, but you at least need something like you know up to say four derivatives um, of uh, gamma and k uh, with respect to you know the standard coordinates R three are supposed to be um, less than epsilon everywhere. Okay, so that in includes the statement that, uh, for instance, the mass, ADM mass of the initial data is very small, um, but it's much stronger than that. So the ADM mass by itself is a very weak um, control, um, but this weighted sublet space here is um, much more strict. You're in good company. Roger Penrose asked the same sort of question when I gave a talk about this uh, at Oxford. Um, Okay, so uh, what I have down here is uh, uh, stolen from, uh, so uh, captured from YouTube video, which I highly recommend uh, you watching, especially if you tune out for the rest of the talk. What you see here is a single black hole that um, um, came into existence by the merger of two black holes that were spying around each other. That's the really cool part of the video. But uh, the theorem will concern uh, the dynamics of this sort of black hole that's slightly out of equilibrium. It's a little egg shaped here. Um, under emission of gravitational waves. So you see these uh, sort of waves propagating out away um, from the black hole. So I'll try to explain it a bit mathematically what's going on. Okay, so first I have to actually tell you briefly something about black holes um, in, um, in the setting of positive cosmological constant. And uh, it turns out that uh, the names now get very confusing. So Schwarzschild de Sitter spacetime uh, involves Schwarzschild and Willem de Sitter who wrote down the de Sitter metric. But this metric was written down as far as I know first by Kotler. Um, sometimes it's called Kotler metric uh, in 1918. And so there is again a very explicit formula it looks exactly like the Schwarzschild metric from before, except there's this extra term here involving the cosmological constant. And um, don't worry again about the specifics of it. The ge geometry is very similar. You have again an event horizon, which is at some slightly distorted value, not 2m anymore, but something slightly different, um, where the light can sort of tilt towards the black hole. But now there's an extra feature where you have a cosmological horizon, which is uh, typically very far away when the cosmological constant is small, um, and the light cones tilt uh, in the outwards region there. 
Okay, so what's happening there, the cosmological horizon is the boundary of the observable universe for an observer like myself who decides to stay stuck on the, on the sofa. And uh, what that means is that any signal that, uh, for instance, a star exploding outside of the part of the universe observable by me, the light of that explosion will never actually reach me, right? Because that light has to travel along these light cones here and it can never possibly get back to me here. Okay, so that part of the universe is invisible to me and the part inside the black hole is also invisible to me. So you have these two horizons. And if you think about the um, propagation of waves in such a space time, they now have two ways of escaping. They can escape into the black hole, they can escape across the cosmological horizon. And so you somehow might suspect that um, there's strong decay of uh, energy and amplitudes of such waves. Okay, there is also a generalization, generalization of the Kerr metric called Kerr de Sitter, which was discovered neither by Kerr nor de Sitter, but by Carter. And uh, it's again an explicit formula, um, which I will not write down. But again, all these metrics are stationary, so there's no time dependence, no dynamics in that sense. And the black hole stability theorem that um, I proved a few years ago uh, in collaboration with Andras Vashi uh, states the following. So now the initial surface is, uh, so it contains, I drew it here, uh, it goes just a little bit into the black hole and extends a little bit outside the cosmological horizon, just giving myself a little bit of wiggle room. And the initial data that I look at are as follows. So you start with a, uh, imagine you start with a Schwarzschild de Sitter black hole. So that has particular initial data, but you want to consider a slight perturbation of this. So um, mathematically, then you take uh, these, the Srivani metric gamma and the second fundamental form K to be close in some you know, high regularity function space uh, to the data of a Schwarzschild de Sitter metric. Um, and uh, the theorem then states that you can solve globally in time the uh, Einstein vacuum equation, which of g minus lambda g is equal to zero, um, so globally in time. But much more interestingly, you can describe the long time uh, behavior of the solution uh, very precisely. Namely, there exists parameters, a black hole mass and a black hole angular momentum. The angular momentum is going to be very small because you're perturbing a non-rotating black hole. Um, so there exist these parameters um, for a Kerr de Sitter black hole, this very explicit family of metrics, um, such that the um, metric, so that the space-time metric involving from this slightly perturbed black hole is actually equal to this very par particular Kerr de Sitter metric plus an error term G twiddle, uh, which is of the gravitational wave tail, and that tail decays exponentially in time at some positive rate alpha. We can guess. So just just for the condition assumptions of the Serum, so you want uh, those data to be close to, to your solution on, on signal, but what about those regions? So inside the black hole, outside the uh, mm -hmm. horizon, they do what they want. Yes, so um, that's the reason why they don't matter at all what happens on, like, uh, on the outside, in that sense, um, is the um, causality or finite speed of propagation. Um, so what happens is that uh, um, whatever... Um, Okay, so if you have a horizon like this uh, event horizon here for the exact metric, whatever happens on the other side here, if, for instance, there was a large bump of curvature or something like that, um, it would never have the possibility to propagate into the uh, exterior of the black hole where, I'm, where, where the theorem is taking place. And uh, so um, sort of that's the reason why you can actually restrict to a spatially compact region because whatever happens... Uh -huh. It cannot change the shape of the horizon, whatever, do, do something to it, right? Because... So I, I do capture... So that's the reason exactly why the initial surface includes just a little bit beyond the event horizon um, because... Uh, so once you're, once you're on this hypersurface, R equals, say, a half, R minus, um, then actually all uh, light rays go strictly outside of the domain. And so that's an open condition in the metric. And so that's why uh, things work out. Yeah, it's a somewhat subtle point. But you still have to impose they are small, right? Because if they are big, they're small. Exactly. Yeah. So the data are small or close to the uh, data of the exact space time, including uh, in this little piece here inside the black hole and including this piece here outside the uh, cosmological horizon. But uh, I don't need to know what happens over here because uh, from the knowledge of uh, the initial data just on this slice here, I can construct uniquely a space-time that has the correct initial data and that is indeed the unique space I'm evolving from these data and whatever happens outside here does not affect the um, unique evolution of the space-time um, in the small neighborhood of the original black hole exterior. So it's really a, a finite speed of propagation argument. But you agree that usually like horizons are a global thing, right? It depends on the entire... Mm -hmm. So somehow here you don't need to know the global space to already know that this horizon was not going to move even though you can... The horizon will move. So 
Um, this so um, in fact it's sort of an exercise I suppose in the stable manifold theorem. Um, if you have a metric uh, of this structure here, so the exact credit sitter metric has uh, a horizon at r equals some particular value, and then you can show that uh, if you have a metric that uh, is exponentially close as time goes off to infinity uh, to this exact credit sitter metric, there again exists a uh, you know a null hypersurface that asymptotes to the um, event horizon of the sort of final credit sitter metric. And this null hypersurface is going to be, of course, slightly distorted, um, and it's equal to the boundary of the, you know, well, part of the backwards light cone of an, uh, of an observer traveling off to infinity that stays outside the black hole. So you can construct the event horizon, but that would be sort of a corollary of the theorem, um, sort of a purely geometric uh, corollary then. Um, and importantly, this, uh, this perturbed event horizon is going to be, you know, some slight wiggly perturbation here of uh, this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the one half and two are just the only numbers that I know. You could make it one minus epsilon and one plus two epsilon. Yeah, so of course, if you take, uh, if you only include, uh, you know, uh, one minus 10 to the minus 10 uh, neighborhood there of the event horizon, then the smallness of the initial data has to be correspondingly very small so that you make sure that the event horizon doesn't wiggle outside of that. Region in which you're working. This number and how big the partition. Yeah, but of course it's not explicit in any way here. But the solution is on how big the partition are inside sigma, not how big the partition are. It's only on sigma, yeah. But sigma includes a little bit beyond the horizons for exactly that uh, reason that the horizon, um, which is only determined once you know the global structure of the space time, um, uh, that it doesn't wiggle outside of the region where you're working. If it did wiggle outside, then that would. Uh, uh, signify a tremendous problem because you're missing information to actually construct the space temporal future because there's a bit between the event horizon and where you somehow have your data where you don't know what what is happening there and then this information would spread to the rest of the space time so that that's something that cannot possibly be uh, controlled other questions is this work for pure de Sitter as well yeah so the pure de Sitter, uh, theorem was uh, proved in the 80s by Helmut Friedrich um, uh, and in that case, there's uh, no uh, freedom of parameters here anymore. So that's for this the neighborhood of the so-called static patch of the sitter space. Uh, the metric converges just back to the very same static patch of the sitter space with exponential uh, decay of gravitational waves. Friedrich's theorem is more general than that, and it actually um, also um, describes the um, uh, structure of the uh, global de Sitter space. So if you really have, uh, you know, de Sitter space as a sub, like as a subset of the Einstein universe, so it's really the full cylinder. In that case, it's actually more interesting because there, um, there's an infinite dimensional space of uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so at each sort of any observer limiting to a point at future infinity, um, you know, on your on the conformal boundary of your de Sitter uh, perturbed de Sitter space time sees locally a static patch of the sitter space, but sort of the different static patches don't fit together in exactly the same way as they do for uh, standard de sitter space, but there's sort of a little bit of uh, um, sort of gluing flexibility that's left. Yeah, so that's a paper by Friedrich from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the theorem. Uh, down here is uh, again, a stolen picture from uh, this uh, famous first uh, black hole merger uh, detection event and uh, so here the there are two black holes that are um, dancing around one another, and then they're colliding somewhere around here, um, and you're left with the single black hole that I showed earlier, um, and it settles down exponentially fast to a stationary state, and you see here sort of this, uh, at least the envelope looks exponentially decaying, and the theorem uh, applies to the noisy part of this uh, picture. Yes, that's uh, mathematics for you. Okay, um, so I will uh, try to explain uh, some aspects of the proof. Probably I'm running much more slowly than I uh, anticipated. That's okay. Um, so, um, so the Einstein vacuum equation is uh, nonlinear. I wrote down the first bit of the expression for it. Um, it's tensorial because you have to solve for a, a symmetric two tensor. So, you know, four by four symmetric matrix. Um, and uh, it has this diffeomorphism variant. So if you throw away all these uh, problems, you're left with a simple warm-up problem, which is uh, which John Wheeler called the poor man's linearization of the Einstein equation. Um, and uh, it's just the scalar wave equation. Okay, so you have your fixed metric, such as fixed the Curtis iter metric. Um, let's make it slowly rotating for some honesty. And you're just looking at a, a scalar valued, so a complex valued function um, on this Curtis iter space time that satisfies the scalar wave equation. So here's the explicit formula for it. And the initial data, let's just say, are smooth. 
So there's nothing with compact support right now because the initial surface um, actually is compact. It just extends a bit you know, um, beyond each of the horizons. Uh, so it's like a bounded annulus. Um, in this case, uh, you actually have very precise uh, description of the long time behavior of the solution of this uh, scalar wave equation. And that was uh, in this generality proof by uh, Semyon Jadlov in 2012. And the statement is the following, namely for any, up to some discrete set of uh, exceptions, uh, for any desired exponential decay rate alpha, the solution of this wave equation actually is equal to a particular expansion that I'll discuss in a second, plus a remainder term decaying at that exponential rate. And so, of course, the, the higher the rate here is, the more terms you get in the expansion. Where these expansion terms, they're a so-called mode solution. So right, every term here has a very particular structure. Um, if you solve the wave equation in, a, in an uh, introductory PDE class, um, then this is sort of the separation ansatz you would make. Uh, you have time dependence, which is just a sort of oscillatory or uh, exponentially decaying or growing in time. Um, and then you have corresponding eigenfunctions, aj of x here, which are sort of eigenfunctions corresponding to the Curtis iter black hole in some sense. And uh, if you're a, a very honest person, then there would also be sort of a T star to some power terms involved there if you have Jordan blocks and so on. But um, let's forget about that. Okay, so that's a, a very uh, beautiful description here, which says that uh, the long time asymptotics is just given by uh, a superposition of these particular mode solutions. Um, and these omega j's here uh, lie in a discrete set of the complex plane subset, um, plus uh, an exponentially decaying error term. So there's some precursors in the math literature on this. Okay, so um, let me just go to the next slide here briefly and tell you what these omega j's actually are. Uh, so here's a numerical calculation of them. So it's sort of solving an eigenvalue problem. And so this particular figure was uh, made by an undergrad student at MIT of mine, uh, Yu Ching Chi. And um, so what you see here is the, uh, all these um, uh, so-called resonances or quasi normal modes, omega, these dots here, lie in the lower half plane. And if you plug this into this exponential, it means they're exponentially decaying in time. They might have non-zero real parts, so they might be oscillating while they decay, exactly what you saw in this um, uh, LIGO picture. Um, and there's also one resonance here at zero, which corresponds to just a stationary uh, behavior. And it turns out that the corresponding sort of eigenfunction is just a constant one or a constant, let's say. Um, and there's lots of structure um, here, but you see there are plenty and plenty of these uh, resonances. Okay, so how is this theorem roughly um, proved? So where do these resonances come from, for instance? Um, so the, the proof of the theorem proceeds via spectral theory. I already mentioned eigenvalue, so it's not surprising now. So you write down the solution of the wave equation um, in terms of uh, the inverse Fourier transform and the time uh, variable. Uh, and so you take the inverse Fourier transform over some uh, you know, shifted uh, real axis. And uh, what you have to do is, okay, so I'm, I'm switching things on you a little bit. I'm looking at the force wave equation now rather than the initial value problem it makes life a little bit simpler. So box V equals some forcing that generates a wave. And the solution is then given by, uh, you take the Fourier transform, so you, uh, you know, put hats over everything and uh, then replace time derivatives by multiplication by the uh, frequency parameter omega. And then the uh, solution is given by, uh, okay, you have your wave operator, you replace all the time derivatives by multiplication by omega. Uh, so that gives you the so-called spectral family box hat of omega. That's a family of operators now just acting on functions um, in the spatial variables only, so on sigma. Um, you invert this operator here, crossing your fingers, you can do that, and apply it to the right hand side of your equation and take the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so that's how you can solve an equation that has time translation symmetry. Um, and uh, then you can uh, try to shift the contour um, in this integral here. The further down you shift the contours, the bigger alpha gets, the more exponential decay this uh, factor he gives you. Um, and as you shift the contour, you might pick up residues from the fact that I'm now telling you uh, that this uh, inverse of the spectral family has poles, so it's a meromorphic family of operators. And um, so that's what I'm writing here. So the resolvent here um, admits a meromorphic continuation uh, from sort of an easy regime to the whole complex plane. The poles are exactly the resonances, these omega j's appearing in this expansion. And uh, then sort of um, more um, sort of for mathematicians, in order to justify the contour shifting in complex analysis, you're always told, make sure that you know, at infinity, you, know, you have to take some limits and make sure that at infinity you don't get uh, um, uh, non-trivial boundary terms or contributions. So that's what high energy estimates are for. Um, they're just polynomial bounds on the um, operator norm of this resolvent here when the real part of omega goes off to infinity so that you can justify contour shifting. And uh, in practice, okay, so now you have sort of this expansion, but of course, if you're interested in actual quantitative information about the wave, does it decay or what does it do? You actually, of course, have to have some information about the poles. So um, 
what I showed you here is that all the poles lie in the lower half plane, except for this one pole at zero. And uh, the conclusion of this is that uh, solutions of the scalar wave equation on Curtis Sitter decay exponentially fast to a constant. And in fact, you can make the statement more precise. They don't just decay to a constant exponentially fast, but in fact, a constant plus some uh, you know, further contributions here of damped harmonic oscillators uh, plus even more exponential decay. Okay, so that's the situation for uh, scalar waves on uh, Curtis Sitter space times. Um, now, for the nonlinear Einstein equation, um, I threw away all kinds of complications and now I have to add them back in. Yes. Of course. So, so the content of this is somehow that we were able to give some more rigor to the fact that the Fedinova modes are all in the lower half plane. Mm -hmm. So, what, what I mean, so the question, it sounds like it's me, but I don't mean it like that. What, what was new about this? Is, for example, not known in this paper by experiments. Oh, so this is. Uh... The physicists just say, okay, they all have negative real parts, so the case, so that you have. Yeah, so um, the, the reference is here. So this reference, just because uh, the undergrad made the picture, so I, I'm giving credit to him. Uh, this review by Berti Cardoso Starinets is a long review um, involving uh, that explains uh, quasi remote calculations and methods for it on all kinds of different space times. It's a very long review. Um, but uh, this is really just strictly sort of the spectral theoretic aspect of it, namely, what are uh, methods to actually find this discrete set of omega j's. Um, and uh, okay, so um, okay, so in other words, what uh, has had been done in the physics literature was uh, you know all kinds of methods and uh, perhaps you know some quantitative information about where these quasi remotes lie. But then actually to syn synthesize this information into a statement about a solution to the wave equation actually um, have this sort of uh, expansion into these quasi remotes. That's a, that's a whole different step. So for instance, something that I will get to later, um, if you look at the, let me just show you actually right away. So if you look at uh, solutions of the uh, wave equation on uh, occur space time, so that is uh, with vanishing cosmological constant, uh, so sort of energy can escape to infinity, but it's always sort of within reach in some sense, so it doesn't escape through a cosmological horizon, then actually solutions of the wave equation with smooth and compact to support initial data do not decay exponentially to a constant, but they actually decay uh, like one over time cubed. So that's a particular decay rate. But of course, what uh, um, you know, the Kerr metric or Schwarzschild metric is the usual uh, model for, um, uh, so at least you know, for understanding this perturbation theory of black holes. And so uh, then people have calculated the quasi remote spectrum for Kerr black holes or Schwarzschild black holes. It looks very much like the picture that I just showed you, except zero is removed. And so then, uh, naively, you might expect, well, solutions to the wave equation uh, on the Kerr spacetime here also have a, an expansion to these exponentially decaying, uh, I mean, damped harmonic oscillators, plus even more exponential decay. But that's completely false, um, because for late times, uh, so actually, the next theorem here says that actually this inverse cubic decay is sharp. Um, so actually, the wave really decays precisely like 1 over t cubed, plus uh, even more decay. And so this, uh, this ring down phase um, is actually mathematically somewhat mysterious uh, without sort of extra um, uh, assumptions on like high frequency initial data or something like that. Um, so how to prove mathematically that's, I'm just jumping to the end of the talk. I'm going to be done in a sec now. Um, <laughs> so here, the, the final uh, thing here is how to actually make sense of this ring down on curve, which is related to your question. Namely, how can you make sense of something like you have this expansion into damped harmonic oscillators uh, for some short amount of time? Um, but then uh, mathematically, we know that for late times, you have this inverse cubic decay. So how can you compare some exponential decay for short times with polynomial decay for late times? Um, you know, it sort of makes no sense unless you have some way to separate time scales between uh, the ring down phase and the uh, late time tail. Um, so all this is saying is that knowledge of the quasi neural modes is a far cry from actually knowing something about the long time behavior of solutions of the wave equation. Um, it, there's a lot of subtleties in between. Perhaps I answered a question that I made up from what you said, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, partly. I mean, again, the main physicists would say you know, there's sometimes you have to resum what they're serious, and then the mm -hmm. sum of exponentials can be algebraic. But, uh, I mean, so mm -hmm. I think maybe the key question thing for me to understand is what could be wrong, for example, what can go wrong that there can be some initial data that's perturbed so they cannot be expanded in what you mean. But because we would just, sort of, well, I would maybe say you know it's expanding for normal modes. Sometimes you have to do the whole sum, sometimes you don't. But can it be the case that you cannot, that there are actually physical solutions that cannot be expanded for normal? Um, 
kind of give a, I would have to think about it a little bit. No, no, it's a very, I'm just a stupid mathematician who can't answer the smart physics question. Um, no, it's a, yeah, we'd have to think about how to answer that uh, properly. I mean, so even in this case here, so let's see. So this theorem by Dyatlov here, um, so there's this asterisk here that excludes certain discrete sets of alphas, which are those um, sort of uh, shifted real axes. So right, you, you integrate over some you know, shifted real axis here. And the excluded values of alpha are those where actually you have uh, an accumulation of uh, resonances, for instance, um, uh, at that axis. So uh, you have to, you know, there's, there's uh, plenty of issues with, uh, you know, does the sum actually converge? And actually, so this, this uh, slowly rotating Curtis-Hitter setting and as a special case proved by Bonnie and Hafner, the Schwarzschild Sitter setting is the only setting that I'm actually aware of, where um, uh, people have made sense of the, the convergence of this infinite sum over resonances. So that's sort of a very subtle issue. It's true in this case, but if you look at the slightly perturbed space time, what might happen, for instance, is that uh, if the angular momentum gets larger, um, there's actually some sort of Zeeman splitting happening of these uh, resonances here. So the, they come with high multiplicity, you, you expand in angular uh, in spherical harmonics, but other than Kerr, you don't have spherical symmetry anymore, so they split um, into um, sort of clusters of quasinormal modes. If the angular momentum is too big, these clusters could get very big, and then you might have a, a real big mess of quasinormal modes here. And if you're unlucky, I mean, you know, for mathematicians, it's always a possibility. Um, actually, the uh, set of imaginary parts of these quasinormal modes is some sort of dense set or something crazy. And then uh, there's no way to make sense of this. Um, uh, yeah, it's not a satisfactory answer, I know, but uh, I, I'll think about it a little bit more. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so um, I threw away uh, some 15 minutes ago all the complications of the Einstein equation, and I want to um, at least talk a very little bit now about uh, how to put them back in. Uh, so the first complication was uh, that the Einstein equation actually involves a symmetric two tensor rather than just a scalar wave. So that's not even written here. Uh, there's the uh, issue of diffeomorphism invariance, which is uh, dealt with by something called gauge fixing. The Einstein equation is nonlinear, so um, usually you solve nonlinear equations by iterating some uh, linear solution theory. Um, and also the space times on which one is going to be working are, of course, not uh, stationary Curtis Sitter space times, but actually the sorts of space times that ultimately come out of the theorem, um, namely space times that only um, asymptotically, as time goes off to infinity, settle down to a Curtis Sitter space time. Um, okay, so there are a bunch of things to do here, and uh, I don't have to cleverly select things I want to talk about. So um, let's first talk about uh, sort of the more, uh, so what the physics literature has uh, discussed on this, which is sort of the, um, which turns out once you add all the math overhead is the main part that you need to know. Um, so you look uh, again uh, for the time being at an exact Curtis Sitter metric, and you try to understand the linear perturbation theory um, of such a Curtis Sitter black hole as a solution of the einstein vacuum equation. Okay, so you just linearize all the equations you're looking at. And uh, so if you remember that the, uh, uh, the einstein vacuum equation is diffeomorphism, well, covariant, I suppose, um, you can take your Curtis Sitter metric, pull it back by any diffeomorphism, write it down in any other coordinate system, and you get another solution of the einstein vacuum equation, which physically is the same Curtis Sitter metric. And uh, if you linearize uh, this sort of uh, statement here, um, uh, in a one parameter family of diffeomorphism, you get the statement that the linearized Einstein equation, so that's linearization here is uh, produced by this capital D, um, annihilates any uh, infinitesimal diffeomorphism, which is to say uh, annihilates every Lie derivative along any vector field V whatsoever. Okay, so in other words, you have uh, a whole lot of solutions to the linearized Einstein equation, but they're all sort of physically irrelevant because they just correspond to uh, changing your coordinate system in some infinitesimal way by sort of flowing it a little bit along this vector field V. Okay, so you have all these trivial solutions. Um, so that's kind of bad if you have too many solutions, uh, you have to get rid of them at some point. Okay, so the physics literature has uh, studied this black hole uh, stability problem uh, at least since the late 50s uh, in this paper by Reggie and Wheeler, and there were many subsequent developments. And uh, so what uh, Vashi and I use is this formulation by Kodama and Ishibashi. And uh, what physicists have um, proved is uh, what's called mode stability, and that's the following statement. So you have your you know, physical black hole, and you consider, um, again, separation of variable style, um, particular perturbations that have this uh, e to the minus i omega t star dependence uh, times some spatial um, uh, dependence h of x. So h of x is a four by four matrix defined at each point of, a, you know, of the three-dimensional spatial manifold that are called sigma. 
And uh, you're looking at uh, solutions that have a particular time dependent, so a particular um, frequency in time. Namely, you're looking at, say, imaginary part of omega is positive. That will correspond to exponentially growing solutions. So these would be very unstable perturbations, linear perturbations of a black hole. Or you're looking at uh, real omegas, but say non-zero ones. So these correspond to just purely oscillating uh, perturbations of the black hole. And what uh, has been proved is that uh, there are no physically non-trivial such uh, linear, uh, linear perturbations, which is to say that every such uh, exponentially growing or purely oscillating but not decaying mode solution um, is actually just the lead derivative of your metric along some vector field. So saying that, which is saying that um, uh, um, any sort of physical degree of freedom, which cannot be undone by just uh, you know, changing your coordinate system, um, uh, is necessarily of the form that omega is equal to zero corresponding to a stationary solution. That would amount to just changing the black hole parameters a little bit. Or uh, imaginary part of omega is negative corresponding to exponentially decaying and possibly oscillating um, solutions. And so that's exactly, again, what I also showed in the, uh, in the scalar wave setting, um, this discrete set of quasi-normal modes in that case. Okay, so uh, in other words, while you have uh, this huge uh, space of solutions of the linearized equation, most of these uh, solutions are actually, uh, so most of these mode solutions are actually physically irrelevant. You somehow eventually mathematically have to get rid of them somehow. Okay, so that's that. And this slide is not the most technical one, but uh, I think it's worth trying to explain um, in, in a little bit of detail. So um, if you want to solve uh, an equation, especially a nonlinear, well, if you want to solve an equation, but you have this huge infinite dimensional, totally uncontrolled null space, um, you're going to be in trouble to say anything about uh, regularity of solutions, asymptotic behavior of solutions, because you can just always add the leader rate along the most crazy vector field, like e to the e to the t times d by dx or something. Um, okay, so you have to get rid of this uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, indeterminacy sort of of the um, of the choice of coordinate system. And the way this is uh, typically done is by um, requiring that uh, extra four uh, pieces of information vanish, and so that's uh, contained in this gauge one form that I call W of G here. So there's some explicit uh, choice that one usually makes. It amounts to for the experts in the audience. Uh, some contraction of Christoffel symbols being equal to zero or something like a harmonic uh, gauge condition. Um, okay, so don't worry about it, but the main point is just that W of G is a one form of the space time. And uh, what you want to solve now is not just the Einstein vacuum equation, but you also want to make sure that this one form vanishes at every point. So you have four extra conditions, which exactly um, is supposed to eliminate the four degrees of functional degrees of freedom that you have in writing down a diffeomorphism on a four dimensional manifold. Um, okay, so you made your life now even harder. Einstein equation is tough, and now you want to satisfy this extra condition. So um, turns out you actually made your life uh, much more tractable now. Um, and this formulation goes back to Dennis de Turk, um, but it was also used basically in Chokebrihas' original work. That you can combine these two pieces uh, in the following way. So I define a nonlinear operator P of G that eats a Lorentz symmetric G and produces a symmetric two tensor, which is just the linear combination um, of the uh, Einstein equation that I want to be satisfied. And I take the symmetric gradient of my one form. And there is some extra um, uh, fudge operator Q here that is useful um, that I'll explain in a second. Okay, so the symmetric gradient takes a one form, produces a symmetric two tensor. So all in all, you have here an, uh, a nonlinear equation for a symmetric two tensor G. And it turns out that this is actually now a wave equation, a quasi-linear wave equation. So you have a perfectly well-posed initial value problem uh, no questions anymore of uh, solutions are only unique up to diffeomorphism. Solutions are unique once you specify the initial conditions. Um, okay, but now you have this other equation that you didn't actually want to solve. You want to solve the Einstein vacuum equation. So how do you get back from solving this equation, P of G equals zero, to solving the Einstein vacuum equation? And uh, that's, again, the standard trick that I'll just mention briefly. Um, so in differential geometry, you learn that the Einstein tensor of any metric is divergence-free. And the Einstein tensor is related to the Ricci tensor by some very simple algebraic manipulation, trace reversal. And so if, if you apply the second Bianchi identity to this uh, equation here, uh, you can eliminate these first two terms and get a decoupled equation for W of Q, basically the divergence of this trace reversal of this third term here is equal to zero. Okay, at the end of the day, you get a, a wave equation, a decoupled wave equation for this, uh, for this gauge condition. And what you then end up doing is you just make sure that this gauge condition is initially satisfied at this initial surface sigma together with its time derivative. And then you just have a homogeneous wave equation with trivial initial data. So the solution will be trivial for all time. And so once you have shown that this W of G term is actually zero, then you also have solved the Einstein vacuum equation. So it's sort of a little bit of a magic trick if you see it for the first time. 
Um, okay, so this is uh, sort of the um, mathematicians would be happy uh, for the small uh, for the local in time theory at this point. Um, but if you want to do global theory, then a little bit more is needed. And it's convenient at this point to imagine that uh, with, uh, that you're a numerical relativist and try to actually solve the Einstein vacuum equation in some gauge uh, sort of uh, globally in time or as long as you can. Um, so what would then happen is that probably your initial data do not satisfy the gauge condition. So you know, the initial data that you cooked up out of this gamma and K do not satisfy the gauge condition uh, initially exactly. There might be some numerical error um, that you know, they fail to be exactly equal to zero. And perhaps you cannot even decide whether it's equal to zero or to yesterday's talk, um, just a joke. Um, okay, so, uh, but numerically then you're, you're, you're solving a wave equation with initial data that are small, but non-zero, but that could mean that the solution actually grows exponentially fast in time. There might be some very strong instabilities there. So what constraint damping uh, does is that it makes a very particular choice of this uh, extra gadget Q here um, so this was introduced in the numerics literature by Broadbeck and uh, uh, Gundlach and actually used to great effect in Pretorius' uh, black hole merger uh, work in some variation. And we also use in our actual math proof that you can choose uh, this Q such that solutions of this, uh, this evolution equation for the gauge condition decay exponentially in time automatically. So in other words, any numerical error of the gauge condition initially is actually damped in time. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, the metric that you're solving for being completely useless because after some hundred time steps, uh, the gauge condition is totally violated and the Einstein equation is violated too. So that's what constraint damping does. It's a, a great mechanism. Okay, so um, now getting back to uh, uh, sort of pure math, if you will, um, we have now the task to understand the global behavior of solutions of this equation. And uh, so before you study nonlinear equations, you should linearize. So we linearize this operator around the Curtis iter uh, metric we're perturbing. And uh, just as in the case of the scalar wave equation, um, you should look first for mode solutions and somehow see whether you can uh, constrain them now more than just saying, well, you know, mode solutions in the upper half plane, I mean, exponential growth are lead derivatives along some vector field, but that's all you can say. So now you have a lot more structure. And uh, what happens is the following. So suppose, just for the sake of argument, you have an exponentially growing mode solution of this linearized uh, uh, combined equation here. Um, then, this uh, exponentially growing uh, mode solution also um, so you can compute whether or not it satisfies the linearized gauge condition okay so you compute sort of the w uh, or the linearized w uh, of this sort of object here it's also going to be exponentially growing in time because you're just uh, applying some well okay it's going to be exponentially growing in time but what you also know is that this w actually satisfies a wave equation all of which you know, all of the solutions of which decay exponentially in time so something cannot be both exponentially growing and decaying in time unless it's identically zero um, and oops, and so therefore uh, you conclude that actually all exponentially growing mode solutions of your combined equation by virtue of this constraint damping automatically satisfy the gauge condition and therefore automatically satisfy the Einstein equation. So linearized Einstein equation. Uh, but once you're at that stage, you have a solution of the linearized Einstein equation. You can apply this mode stability theorem and you know that, well, this exponentially growing mode solution was actually um, unphysical. So it was just the lead derivative along some vector field V can even say what the vector field V uh, is. It's again going to be a mode solution of, I mean, a mode vector field of that same sort. And then you can say, well, I can even go further because now I have a, um, uh, a mode solution um, of this sort, which I know satisfies the gauge condition. So you can plug this mode solution into the gauge condition and get uh, an extra equation for this vector field V. And ultimately at the end of the day, once the dust settles, uh, you actually uh, find that uh, this uh, combined wave operator here um, actually, again, only has a discrete set of quasi normal modes. And the set of quasi normal modes looks very much like in this picture here, except it does happen that there are quasi normal modes still in the upper half plane corresponding to the exponential growth. But uh, I already said that these will automatically be uh, lead derivatives. So somehow there might be some finite dimensional residual um, gauge freedom uh, corresponding to exponential growth, but that's a technical thing. Okay, so. That's the, um, that's the linearized theory. And then you want to put things, uh, put things together um, in a nonlinear iteration scheme. And I'll just make that uh, somewhat brief. So rather than just trying to solve for this um, uh, metric tensor um, for the black hole stability problem all in one go, you separate your work into the various bits and pieces that um, uh, constitute the metric uh, ultimately. Namely, you have to find the black hole parameters M and A. You have to find the exponential decaying gravitational wave tail G twiddle. 
And then there's some extra parameter um, that uh, allows you to modify the gauge condition a bit to get rid of this residual finite dimensional degree of freedom, but I will henceforth uh, ignore that. Okay, so you need to solve this nonlinear uh, wave equation here. And uh, well, uh, if you want to solve a nonlinear equation, you can use some fixed point argument. So we use the uh, Newton or Nash Mohs iteration, um, which is just uh, the usual method to find uh, roots of polynomials applied now to a nonlinear PDE setting. Um, okay, and so um, at each point, so at each step in the iteration scheme, you have a current guess G sub K um, of the metric. So in other words, you have a guess M sub K, A sub K for what are the final black hole parameters. You have a guess G twiddle sub K, what is the gravitational wave tail currently, but you haven't probably quite exactly solved the equation yet. So there's some error term here and you're trying to solve away the error term by uh, solving a linear equation with this error term on the right-hand side and just making this, uh, this uh, simple um, update step here. So that's just Newton iteration here. And in order to uh, repeat this iteration scheme here, you have to say, you have to prove that this uh, H here is actually, again, sort of compatible with this form. Concretely meaning that this H is actually equal to uh, an infinitesimal um, change of the black hole parameters. And so you change the mass and angular momentum by some M dot and A dot plus a gravitational wave tail. So then you say, well, the, the real final black hole parameters are probably just the obvious update. The current black hole parameters plus the update of the parameters uh, suggested by the linear theory. So it's, uh, it looks complicated with all the dots and uh, math frack, but uh, the idea is very simple. Um, and so notice again that this, uh, uh, ex the expectation that I'm writing down here is exactly uh, what I'm trying to motivate also in the scalar setting, namely the solution decays exponentially fast to a stationary solution. But of course, in this uh, Einstein context here, the stationary solution is not going to be a constant, but uh, a symmetric two tensor. Um, corresponding to a stationary time independent perturbation of your black hole, um, exactly obtained by uh, just changing the mass of the black hole a little bit or spinning it up a little. Okay, so um, mathematically now at uh, each point uh, of this, at each step of the iteration scheme, you have to solve this linear wave equation here, which is going to be a wave equation on this Curtis Sitter space time. Uh, but the metric is not exactly Curtis Sitter, but it's just asymptotically Curtis Sitter. So now you. Um, uh, you have to understand linear waves on a spacetime that uh, only settles down exponentially fast to a stationary Curtis Sitter spacetime. And now, if you are a fan of the Fourier transform, you think that you're stuck now because you have uh, no translation invariance anymore. So you cannot just solve this sort of equation here by taking the Fourier transform and uh, using all this um, resolvent analysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, not all, all help is lost. So uh, you can combine this uh, spectral theory with uh, microlocal tools. And I'll just briefly try to explain that. Yeah, so nine minutes. Um, okay, so um, the task now, let me remind you again, is that uh, we have to somehow find a way to control solutions of this uh, linear wave equation on a space time that settles down exponentially fast to a Curtis Sitter space time. Um, okay, and so here's just a, a quick primer slide on microlocal analysis. I'm actually giving a course about this at ETH uh, starting next Tuesday, I believe. So whoever is at ETH, please come and join. Um, and I'm sure also external visitors are welcome. Um, and so what microlocal analysis uh, is in a nutshell, it's the analysis of uh, partial differential operators in phase space so in the cotangent bundle, uh, position and momentum. And uh, at the heart of it is a very close connection between uh, PDE and classical mechanics. And uh, okay, so at the first level, what happens is that associated with any linear partial differential operator, like the wave operator, you can associate a, a function on, uh, on the cotangent bundle, which is the so-called principal symbol. And so in this case of the wave equation, uh, the wave operator, this principal symbol, uh, so it takes two arguments, the um, you know, space-time point and the space-time momentum zeta, and it just produces you the squared length of this uh, momentum, space-time momentum vector. Okay, so um, in other words, on um, on Minkowski space, uh, some oh, this this would just be something like tau squared minus c squared. Okay, so that's just the um, squared length of momentum vectors. Um, okay, that's number one. Uh, independent number two is uh, how do you actually measure regularity of uh, solutions or distributions micro locally, so in phase space. I suppose uh, most of you will know what it means for a distribution to be locally in some L2 space or Sobolev space. Namely, you just cut it off by some smooth, compact, and supported cutoff function. And then you ask, does the, uh, does the product lie in L2 or HS or something? And the, um, 
Okay, membership in HS is by definition the same as, so you localize your distribution here by some cutoff chi two, you take the Fourier transform and you ask whether it lies in a weighted L2 space in frequency, right? So you multiply by a frequency to the S, you basically take S derivatives um, of your localized distribution and you ask whether that lies in L2. The notion of microlocal regularity is just a, um, an extra localizer inserted in, uh, in phase space. I mean, what you do is that uh, you're interested in the microlocal regularity near a point Z naught, this is where you cut off to, and also to a direction zeta naught, uh, so a direction of uh, momenta. And you take a cutoff chi one that just uh, um, depends on the direction of your momentum vector. Um, and you just uh, cut off to a small neighborhood of the ray in the direction of zeta naught. Okay, so you take the Fourier transform, you, uh, so you localize your distribution, take the Fourier transform and you localize to, an, uh, to a conic region going off to infinity. And then you ask whether that lies in the weighted L2 space. So you're not asking for all frequencies to decay like zeta to the minus s, but only the frequencies in that particular conic direction. Okay, so that's, that's all it is. That's an honest definition here. And the beautiful uh, uh, foundational theorem tying these two things here together is the propagation of singularities or regularity statement by Dusser, Madden, Hermander. And it states the following. Um, so in the context of the wave equation, you have a solution of the wave equation box of phi is equal to zero. It also works for, you know, in the case that phi is tensor valued and so on. Um, the first information is that they're regular outside of the light cone. Um, so regular in the sense that they have arbitrary HS regularity. Um, and most interestingly, inside the light cone, so in, inside the collection of light cones, um, there's actually a propagation phenomenon happening that regularity propagates along the flow of the Hamiltonian vector field of the underlying classical dynamical system. Because here's Hamiltonian vector field written down from classical mechanics. And uh, the statement is that regularity in the sense of, uh, you know, microlocal HS membership actually propagates uh, in phase space along the flow of this Hamiltonian system. So if you think about uh, singularities as uh, being uh, sort of um, uh, high, well, how to put this best? Um, um, yeah, so if you think, think of singularities as sort of a, a stacking up of very high oscillations, um, then uh, the statement says that these very high oscillations move along, uh, so they sort of correspond to little particles being localized roughly near these high oscillations. And these high oscillations uh, of your solution phi of the wave equation travel exactly along the trajectory of this little particle um, that they represent. Uh, so it's a beautiful connection there. Now to apply this in the context of um, uh, Curtis Sitter spacetime or asymptotically Curtis Sitter spacetime, you have to understand what this um, uh, Hamil what the Hamiltonian flow for the underlying classical dynamical system does. Um, okay, and so the metric is explicit um, and has you know some exponential decaying error term. And so at, ultimately what you can do is you uh, start at the initial surface where you know what the regularity of your uh, wave is because you're given initial data. And then you can propagate this regularity using this Dusser-Mathermander theorem, but it turns out there's uh, also um, sort of other interesting phenomena that can happen uh, when you're in this uh, global in time setting. And so I just want to briefly mention one of them, for instance. Uh, okay, so, um, okay. So just for the plane wave equation, this Hamiltonian vector field restricted to the light cone is just um, uh, generates the null geodesic flow in phase space. So just following uh, light rays. Um, but if you're interested in global in time behavior, then you have to also uh, investigate the uh, uniform as time goes off to infinity behavior of light rays. And that's more interesting than just, well, light goes from here to there. Um, and for instance, if you fall into the black hole and you turn off the laser pointer just before you cross it, then that light will actually escape the black hole and you know, escape out here across the cosmological horizon if you're lucky. If you turn on the laser pointer just as you are on the event horizon, the light just gets stuck at the event horizon and sort of gets more and more redshifted, I suppose. If you turn on the laser pointer, once you've already crossed the event horizon, then this light, as long as uh, uh, together with yourself, will fall to the center of the black hole. Okay, so you see that there's this sort of uh, unstable manifold picture here. And uh, if you pass to some sort of compactification of time at time equals infinity, you actually get a saddle point structure of the flow. Um, okay, and it turns out that there, um, in this compactified setting, there are lots of uh, variants of the stuster matter theorem um, that uh, allow you to propagate uniform regularity control. Okay, so the upshot um, uh, for getting all these details here is that uh, using uh, largely qualitative sort of dynamical properties of the Hamiltonian flow, um, so the null geodesic flow on, on your space time, you can control regularity globally uh, in terms of regularity of initial data. 
Okay. And so then the combination of the two is a sort of a simple function analysis, which I will skip because it's uh, almost time. Um, but you can combine uh, sort of this regularity theory for the um, uh, asymptotically cardiocytometric and the uh, precise uh, spectral theory for the uh, stationary problem here into a single um, solvability theory for the uh, operator we're interested in. Uh, solvability theory, including precise asymptotic control, like exponential decay to uh, stationary states. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's what you can do. Okay, so I suppose I should just uh, actually stop the talk and uh, with this slide here, basically, that um, uh, the uh, the way that uh, we prove this black hole stability theorem is that we combined uh, this uh, microlocal analysis uh, point of view, which is very robust and sort of only relies on mostly qualitative features of uh, null geodesic flow. So it's a very geometric dynamical systems uh, um, input that you need. Uh, together with a precise spectral theory for uh, you know that's based on the Fourier transform so you um, exploit this time translation invariance um, to control uh, linear waves on uh, sort of interesting time dependent space times globally and when you solve the Einstein equation you in addition have to devise a gauge condition and uh, this constraint damping um, and also uh, you can um, solve for the final black hole parameters try to figure out what black hole does your solution converge to at the same time um, as you find all the other uh, sort of parameters of the solution, like the gravitation wave tail, perhaps the gauge condition, and so on. Okay, so I wanted to also tell you a little bit about results for lambda equals zero, but I already mentioned some uh, uh, earlier. So the, the nonlinear stability problem uh, for curved black holes is still open, but there's been lots of uh, recent activity. Uh, so I mentioned uh, here uh, some, uh, some results um, that are still so this one here is uh, still in progress uh, for the Kerr case. Um, and so then um, I already explained a little bit about uh, linear waves here. One can again prove the decay for linear waves using spectral theory. Um, okay, in which case the resolvent no longer is meromorphic, but actually has a logarithmic singularity at zero, uh, which inverse Fourier transforms to particular uh, time decay here. Okay, and we also have a result with uh, Dietrich Hafner and Anders Vashi on the linear stability of Kerr black holes. Um, which is very pretty, but I don't have time to talk about it. Okay, and so uh, I already mentioned the uh, the way that where this is going. So ring down on Kerr is something that that would be very interesting to understand. There are some results, for instance, by Dyatlov um, in the case that the initial data are uh, have very high frequency, in which you have in which case you have this extra parameter that allows you to separate time scales. Um, and uh, what has not been done mathematically rigorously is actually proving this quasi normal mode expansion uh, for these asymptotically curved sitter space times. So, in the context of the main theorem, we only proved exponential decay with no further structure to a curved sitter metric. But what one actually measures physically is, uh, you know, this uh, few pieces of this um, uh, ring down phase. And so, proving that rigorously would be a very interesting uh, task. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. You show that the um, cat is exponentially stable. The sitter alone asymptotically is care on the sitter unstable. Um, so that's not known rigorously yet. So there are, um, so the conjecture is that even plain anti de sitter with no black holes uh, inside um, is unstable if you have uh, reflecting boundary conditions at the um, uh, ADS boundary. Um, so ADS is uh, different from uh, Kerr de Sitter and Kerr space times because the um, because waves can reach this uh, conformal boundary in finite time, and you have to specify boundary conditions. And so then the stability question becomes dependent on the choice of boundary conditions. Um, so uh, the two standard ones are um, reflective boundary conditions and dissipative boundary conditions, where sort of waves just uh, escape, quote unquote. And uh, so I believe in the latter case, I'm not sure if it's been proven yet, but in that case, one expects uh, uh, stability of the ADS solution. But in the former case, uh, one expects that actually uh, one can, so there's work by uh, Georgos Moshidis um, in the setting of Einstein equation coupled with the scalar field, where he actually constructs a very elaborate uh, sort of initial data, which consists basically of uh, sort of small beams. So they're really small in some high regularity sense um, that uh, travel sort of towards the, uh, center of ADS and somehow interact there. For instance, you can place a little mirror there. You know, there are various ways he does this construction. And so he can make these uh, little uh, rays inter interact. And at every time they interact, one of the rays sort of gets a little bump in energy. Then they travel out towards the ADS, uh, ADS boundary, get reflected there, nothing too much happens. And then they get reflected again at some interior mirror or something like that. 
and get an extra bump of energy. And he can show that this can continue uh, so far that actually a trapped surface forms, even though the initial data were um, very small in every sensible sense. Um, and so once you have trapped surface formation, then you expect that some black hole will form. So that's a very dramatic instability of uh, ADS. Um, so if already plain ADS is unstable with these reflective boundary conditions, I presume if you add a black hole, it's not going to get any better. Um, for the dissipative boundary conditions, I'm not sure what the... The black hole will damper. If you add the black hole, you expect it to get better. Because the black hole will be a source of dissipation. Um, possibly. So if you so Morshidis' works were largely in spherical symmetry, in which case that would probably be the case. But um, I presume that if, uh, I mean, you could imagine, I'm just guessing, that uh, if you um, try to do this, I mean, it's going to be much more complicated probably. But you might be able to, uh, you know, direct these little bumps that they actually just go around the black hole a little bit and still interact in some way. I mean, I, I don't know what would happen. I think there are plenty of numerical simulations, but I'm not familiar with them uh, really, um, that show all kinds of interesting instabilities in the ADS setting. So I mentioned exponential decay for Curtis iter for the Kerr problem, you only expect, so in the scalar case, you have you know, this uh, inverse cubic decay. And uh, for uh, solutions just of the scalar wave equation on uh, ADS, uh, Holtzegel and Smule VC uh, showed uh, only one over log decay. So it gets extremely, extremely weak. Maybe maybe you can say a bit more. So if uh, between Kerr, the sitter and Kerr and Minkowski, you had this very big difference between exponential and power law. Mm -hmm. So in the in that plane, in this omega plane, what is the, the main difference? So in the um so I can try to draw a picture. Um so if this is the omega plane. Um, in the case of, uh, uh, of uh, Kerr de Sitter, when the uh, cosmological constant is positive, then actually the resolvent uh, was meromorphic on the whole complex plane. And uh, then you have a bunch of uh, poles here, the quasi normal modes, and so on, um, but uh, extends to the whole complex plane. And so if you take the inverse Fourier transform, you can somehow shift the contour down here, get exponential decay up to the contributions from these poles. Um, in the setting of uh, Kerr, um, the picture um, is as follows. So it turns out that, so this is something that I sketched a little bit there, that actually the resolvent does not um, extend meromorphically to the whole complex plane, but there's actually a non-algebraic singularity here. And so, um, so in the scalar case, there's something. Yeah, so it might be a branch point, the question of whether actually the resolvent ex exists on the logarithmic cover of the complex plane, it's not known. Um, it's a natural thing to suspect, but um, um, I don't actually know how to prove that. Um, so uh, never, nevertheless, uh, many people have computed quasi-normal modes for even curved black holes. And so what is true still, which was proved by um, uh, Sabareto and Zworski, is that actually the, um, you know, this resolvent family here actually does extend uh, sort of across the uh, non-zero part of the real axis. And so um, I'm, I, I think you can extend it uh, you know, all the way. Um, possibly to a logarithmic cover, but I'm not sure exactly how far the results go. But let's just say you go into some conic neighborhood here. And so you can extend it and you'd actually do find uh, quasi-neural modes here, uh, which have been computed as well. But the problem is that uh, um, if you actually want to um, extend, I mean, expand a solution for late times of your wave equation into these quasi-neural modes, um, you know, using the spectral, I mean, using the Fourier transform, you might somehow try to take a contour that goes like this, so you have exponential decay, but you somehow need to do something about this branch point here. And no matter what you do, this branch point will always give you then the dominant contribution. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the fundamental difference. What type of modes from branch um, it's, uh, So there are no uh, modes in the typical sense. So um, what, what happens actually is uh, pretty cool. Um, so I, I said here that, uh, so you have inverse cubic decay, which comes about from taking the inverse Fourier transform of this, that gives you T to minus three. Um, and there's this constant in front. Uh, so why is it a constant? It turns out that, uh, um, right, so most solutions are particular solutions of the equation, uh, you know, this here, A is equal to zero, right? These are mode solutions. Uh, it turns out that the constant is, uh, comes about because it's a mode solution at zero energy. Uh, namely constant solve the wave equation that's a well-known fact um, and so this is uh, so this here is then just a constant c so this is where uh, sort of modes still show up conjecturally even though it's not proved um, you can have uh, even further terms in the expansion here 
So uh, I, what I conjecture is true is that actually the solution of the wave equation has a full asymptotic expansion similar to the resonance expansion, but now in terms of powers, inverse powers of time and perhaps some logs. And the coefficients showing up in this expansion are, so here's a constant, which are just sort of explained here. And uh, further down coefficients would also be sort of mode solutions at zero energy, uh, but uh, with even more growth at infinity, right? Constants don't decay in spatial infinity. And the coefficient of t to the minus four, I suspect would grow linearly in space and so on and so forth. So there's still a little bit of a, a generalized mode notion that uh, enters here. Um, that uh, you know tells you what the coefficient basically of these uh, um, singular terms are. Thank you.